Uh, sometime during the meeting, we'll pass a donation canister around. If you're interested in donating to our organization, because we do have costs of you know, about them, uh, please do so. And if you're not interested, that's fine too. Okay. I, at this time, I'm going to ask our state representative to step forward, Mr. Kurt Dammer. Aren't you all welcome, Mr. Kurt Dammer? We've allowed quite a bit of time for Kurt today, and uh, if there's anybody here that has any personal agenda, uh, please keep it to the end of the meeting and you can talk with him then. Uh, but you can, you're welcome to ask any questions if you want to, uh, as long as he's got time. Kurt, we welcome you and we want to thank you for coming to our Tea Party booth. We only have an hour and a half. <laughs> I come from Lansing and I bring good news. <laughs> right. Right. Well, you know, I had some uh, very interesting conversations over the last week uh, to two weeks as we had our so-called spring break out of Lansing. All that meant was is that we didn't have session for the last two weeks. It gave us some time to get back into district. Unfortunately, you can see I'm fighting a bit of a cold, but uh, excuse the cough drops, but uh, it's going to keep me going. Uh, yeah, there's been so many things that are going on in Lansing. It is an eye-opener to get down there. I feel very at home, even though I've only been there for three months, I feel like I've been there for three years. Uh, that's the kind of work we've been doing there. Uh, let's start from the beginning. January 1st, we get down there, and one of the goals of the GOP was to get our committees up and running as quickly as possible. We knew that the previous two years, they didn't until, I think it was about March, have their committees together, and not up and running until about April. Knowing what the budget is, and what was going to happen, um, our new speaker, Chase Bolger from Marshall, is doing a remarkable job. He set a goal of having everything up and running by the 1st of February. We had a committee selected. Um, I was blessed to have, uh, even as a freshman legislature, legislator, which is not much different in, in experience from those who have been there already for a whole two years, which our Speaker of the House has two years. Most of our leadership team has two years in unlike many previous years or how the state of Michigan has been run for, for many, many years. But I can say I feel very positive with the people that were put into the positions. Uh, as I mentioned, I was, uh, I was very surprised and blessed to have been selected as the chairman of the Military Veterans Affairs and Homeland Defense Committee. I've got a remarkable committee. First thing I said to my committee when we got together, this is a committee that will have no aisle. We will not play partisan politics. It's not about us, it's about the veterans, it's about our homeland defense, <clears throat> and it's about our National Guard troops. And that was made very clear from day one, and I will continue to stress that point, which I don't have to, because I do have a remarkable committee that uh, Speaker Bolger has put together. Uh, I'll start out with the uh, start out with military veterans affairs. Uh, I can go through some of the things that we're doing with committees, and then you can ask questions, or we can wait till the end. Um, but I'd like to cover some of the military veterans affairs stuff first, and then we'll go into budget. We can go into all kinds of things. But this is the freshest uh, projects that I've been working on. Military veterans affairs, what's amazing is the state of Michigan, and we have uh, one of the states that have more veterans in it than just about any other state in the United States other than Texas. We have 700,000 veterans in the state of Michigan. And as I brought the leaders of the American Legion and the VFW and the BVA and the Blue Star and Gold Star Moms, and the Marine Corps League, and the AMVETS, and on and on as we brought these groups together, I was really surprised to hear what they had told me, is that they've been lacking representation for a number of years. The things that they wanted and needed have not been answered. And the previous committee had only met two times in the last two years. We met four times in the first month. And we're meeting with these groups daily. I get phone calls and emails. I mean, we're talking all the time. What do our veterans need? <clears throat> our veterans need a lot. You know, 700,000 people out there. We've got programs out there that a majority of these veterans have no idea that is in place. And we get calls every day from veterans who said they've been trying for years and family members who have been trying for years. We've got World War II veterans that qualify for VA disability. And they've been trying since the 1940s to try to get benefits. Our VA hospital is backed up 22,000 in Michigan. 22,000 folders for veterans in Michigan.
trying to get benefits. Now, you know, we've talked before about the new VA clinic that's in Bad Axe. You know, that was maxed out in about 30 to 60 days. You know, they got a little flavor of that. They didn't think that would happen for a year to a year and a half. But they're just swamped. You know, we're already, I think, the 13 employees up there. They're probably going to need the next 3,000 feet they thought they would need in two to three or five years. So we did plan ahead at a time in here in county for that extra 3,000 feet they're going to need up there. Uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, programs that uh, I recently hosted, one for the veterans, which I did hold, host a summit on a Friday. It's a great time to get business done in Lansing because everybody's back in district. So I hosted the summit and I brought in all these groups and we talked about everything that we needed. And uh, six items turned into 12, 12 items turned into 16, 16 items turned into 22. And we went through the entire day. We had lunch, we stayed there. I know it was tough on some of our older vets, but God bless them, they hung in there because they were representing some pretty large groups. One of the things that we talked about was veterans in prison. You know, with 40 some thousand prisoners, we have, uh, what, seven to nine percent of our prisoners are veterans. It's unbelievable. But that's what we put in jail. We pick up veterans coming home from Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. We pick them up coming they were home from Vietnam. They got PTSD, they have traumatic brain injuries, they have physical problems, they have other things that they need to be addressed. And, you know, we're, we put a guy in jail, what was the one he had? Three tours in Iraq, and uh, they put him in jail for three years. I think he ended up there now for five or six years with no help. No mental help in the, in the, in the prison system. <clears throat> but, uh, and once they get in there, they can't go to the VA and use their VA benefits because the VA hospitals and clinics aren't sent up, sent up to take our veterans. So as we got into all of these things that we needed, uh, you know, 4,000 veterans in prison, maybe more, because we really don't have a monitoring system to show us um, exactly what that number is. There's no really big pre-screening process. We just missed a $4 million federal grant that was waiting for someone to say, I'll, I'll take this one and we'll carry the ball and we'll create a system in the state of Michigan that will evaluate every prisoner that goes in and one of the first questions we'll ask you, ask you is, are you a veteran? And then we'll follow up on that question is, are you a veteran? What are your needs? Where did you serve? Did you have any injuries? Do you have VA benefits? We don't do that. <clears throat> but all we do is find out is at some point during the process of them going into prison, are you a veteran? It's not the process of while you're going to court with the prosecuting attorney, are you a veteran? That's where we need it. We need it on the streets with law enforcement officers. Another story was about uh, um, a young man, and I believe they were down in Ann Arbor and something was going on. And uh, they told him to evacuate the area, and he was actually walking out of the store, not really part of this uh, group that was meeting, whatever they were doing. And as he walked out of the store, there was somewhat of a riot squad, I guess, a kind of car marching down the street. And when they told him to leave the area, instead of leaving the area, he went down into a shooting prone position. So now he's down on one knee, and they're telling him to leave the area, and they're shooting tear gas. He doesn't leave. So he's just about ready to get roughed up, locked up, and hauled away when one of the sergeants from the police department says, grabbed him by the back of the shoulder and said, listen, I want you to fall back with me to the green zone. And the guy got up and he walked with him and he walked off to the side of the curb and got on the sidewalk because he understood that that was a safe area. I mean, he just had this flashback of whatever happened and he had two or three tours overseas. But it hadn't been for that police officer who was also a member of the National Guard who spotted what this guy was doing right away, where would he be? Might be in prison, might be in jail. He might be, have been convicted with a felony on his record. <clears throat> so we're working on, right now that I'm working on a proposal, and we're, we're hoping to have uh, ready to go, it needs to be ready to go by May 1st with our veterans courts in the state of Michigan. My committee's had testimony already um, uh, from uh, one judge. Uh, we've talked to some attorneys, some prosecutors. Uh, we've had uh, testimony with the prison system. And uh, we're working with the Michigan Prosecutors Association to develop these veterans' courts. Some people say they're not fair. Well, they can say they're not fair, but you know, we owe our veterans something. It, it is a different situation with some of these veterans coming back. So we may hear a little bit, we've talked with the ACLU, and they've actually took a step back on this. 
which I think I was a little surprised. So we're uh, proposing our veterans' courts um, in circuit courts across the state of Michigan. It looks to be about 15 to 19 circuit court judges that will be removed. And uh, that's because we've lost a lot of population. Some of the counties, like Huron County, in the first place, never really should have had a circuit court judge, but that was a deal swung many years ago with one of the former governors. But now we've lost, up here, we've lost 6,000 people. <clears throat> so we're looking at have, maybe having a regional veterans court. And we're hoping to find judges and attorneys to serve on the veterans court that were veterans. And even if that's not the case, we'll find good people to serve on these courts. We just need to find out how to get the veteran to the court. Um, there's also a bill I have going forward for video um, testimony. And, uh, and that'll help. Um, so you could be in one county and actually go before the veterans uh, judge that might be three or four counties away, but it's somebody that will understand what's going on. Now, veterans court, just to be clear, veterans court is not, if you go murder somebody or you rape somebody, you're not going to veterans court, you're heading to circuit court. But if there's something going on that they saw that, that was related, related to a, a injury that may have occurred while you're in military service, uh, then that's where you should be. You know, if you got a couple of drunk drive-ins, maybe we should have had you down to the VA to begin with. And the biggest problem we see with the veterans is with our National Guard members. If you're on active duty, you come back from a tour and you're back on your base. You have a hospital there, you work with the same people that know you. Um, you and you've got different, uh, different groups on base that are looking out for you. The chaplain, you're there every day. When you come back as a member of the National Guard, you come back, you get off the plane, they hand you your bag, and you go home, and you maybe wait for the next drill. And some of these guys, just they've ended their tour. They don't have a 60, 90, or 120 day out processing program like the active duty forces do. They don't come home as a National Guard member and have a, a counselor set with them in front of a computer and say, we're gonna help you find a job, we're gonna get you set up for unemployment, we're gonna do all these things for you to help you get back on your feet as you head back home. We don't have that with the National Guard. <clears throat> so in addition to our veterans courts, I've asked all of the American Legions, the VFWs, the BVA, the AMVETS, the Marine Corps League to offer this to all of our veterans. Offer the first year of your membership in any of your organizations for free. We need to do an outreach. We can't just mail things to people and say, hey, you got three letters in the mail. That's what I was getting as a response. What is our outreach to these veterans coming home? Well, we sent them five letters, but we had no response. So, well, maybe the guy had a TBI, had a brain injury, maybe he's got PTSD, or, you know what, some people are just so distrustful of the government, they see that coming from the state of Michigan or federal government, they throw it right in the trash. But what we need to is we need to get out there and we need to mentor, we need to knock on doors as veterans. We need to get outreach programs going. And uh, so that's what we're working on. And that's what each, what each of these organizations are taking back for their state meetings over the next couple of months. And I believe most of them have approved to give somebody, if you have not been a member, your first your membership for free. That's very important. Uh, the other thing is, is we just, uh, just gave this proposal here about two weeks ago, and it's uh, really getting a lot of interest, is for uh, to have two veterans prisons in the state of Michigan. And we figure with those two veterans prisons, with about 4,000 veterans in prison, with those two prisons, um, and if we could bring the VA into the fold, what that would save the state in the medical and the counseling for, for our PTSD, the TBI, for the physical stuff, for the prescriptions. And the VA has been very open so far to many of these ideas that we're working for. Even in the veterans court, we put a, we put a computer, a laptop, goes in that veterans court. And with the counselor representing the veteran, they can work back and forth while things are going on with the VA. And they can pull up documents and medical documents and give them to the judge. And the judge can request that that person goes through some type of counseling and they put it right there and they shoot it right to the VA. And we're doing the same thing if we can do this with the prisons. Now, what we're estimating that we could save with this project, and you're the first ones to hear it other than the ombudsman, is about $200 million a year. That's substantial. But even more than that, we're getting 4,000 veterans. We may not get every veteran to qualify for these benefits, but we're gonna get a lot of these guys and these women the benefits that they should have had. <clears throat> We're going to get them before they should have gone to prison, before they went to jail. This program is already running up in a couple locations in the state of Michigan. And you know what? They have had zero return. Zero of these veterans, none of these veterans have come back a second time over the last two years. They got them help the first time through and they haven't been back. 
that's unheard of in any type of a program to keep people out of prison and out of jail and get them help. So that's, that's quite remarkable for, uh, again, our 700,000 outreach. Do you realize over the next 10 years, 200,000 of those veterans will have passed away? We'll be down to 500,000 veterans in 10 years. And that's sad to think of. But you know what? Our numbers of the ones that we're going to have to treat are going to skyrocket. Uh, they're talking about uh, several hundred thousand veterans right now returning from Afghanistan and Iraq over the last 10 years have traumatic brain injury, you know, have PTSD, have other physical injuries that they're not being treated for. <clears throat> One gentleman, uh, a young guy, we went and got some cats the other day, about three weeks ago, I think, forgot we were coming back from. And our little guy wanted some kittens, so we grabbed the Saginaw newspaper on the way back, uh, coming from Lansing. And uh, it just happened to be one of the streets. We're going to be driving down 75. It's only off five minutes off the street. And we found a house that had some tabby cats, little kittens. Well, let's pull in and take a look. You know, we'll, we'll check it out. So we went down the side street. We got to the house. I knocked on the door. And the young guy that, not, that answered the door, he had a Special Forces t-shirt on. And he was looking kind of rough. And, uh, you know, you could tell he was, uh, he was struggling with life. But we had a real good conversation as we picked up these kittens, at least he and I did. And I found out this guy, the, the movie Black Hawk Down, he was one of the forces, one of the Marines that were inside the building. He is the guy that shot the RPG through the wall, that led his 18 troops out the back wall, while he held, you know, we call them the skinnies, excuse my language, held them off for 19 hours and was shot in the lungs. He sent me home. I said, well, are you a member of the Marine Corps League? Are you a member of VFW? Are you doing anything? He said, he said, hell no. It took me a year and a half to get benefits. He said, you've got to be kidding me. And then he shows me the, his rack. Here's a silver star, two bronze stars, four purple hearts. It took you a year and a half to get your benefits. He says, I finally got them, and I'm so disappointed. He says, I won't go to anything. I gave him my card, and I said, I'm going to come back, and you will go to something. <laughs> Trust me. And then I introduced myself, and he said, well, I just gave two of my kittens to the chairman of the Military Veterans Affairs Committee. Uh, looks like I'm going to be joining the Marine Corps League. I says, I'm a guarantee you, you will be. And you will be going to meetings, and we will make sure that you get everything you deserve. But here he was. He just locked himself in the house for at least 10 years, and that was what it was. He lived there with mom and grandma and his brother, and really didn't leave the house. And, uh, but it was a shame that he said he had to take a year and a half to get his benefits with, with that kind of a record. Somebody should have met him and brought him in and taken him by the hand on this stuff. We're going to change that. And we can change that because we've got good leaders in our legion and our VFW, and we've got good leaders in our state. The new Department of Veterans Affairs Director, Jason Allen, remarkable. Um, a Democratic Senator, uh, now is serving the state of Michigan as the DVA director working in Lansing. I work with him every day. We have a lot of conversations and we, we, we uh, have a real good, uh, real good rapport along with Senator John Molnar who is the Senate Chair of Military and Veterans Affairs. So a lot of really neat and exciting things happening for the veterans. What's even more exciting is that uh, as I brought what I thought were very unique ideas to the table and I start presenting them to to Jason on our Veterans Affairs, I got this and this and we're going to try all these things <laughs> And he said, before I look at him, he says, let me tell you what the governor's plan is for veterans. And I swore he broke into my office that week. Because he had the same pages, basically the same agenda as I had. It's just that it hadn't been addressed. And I said, well, this makes it really easy, Jason, because you know what? The governor's already approved this, he's approved this, he's approved this. We don't have to worry about that, about anybody uh, higher up trying to stop any of these things because it's wanted by the governor. It's also wanted by the House, and it's wanted by the Senate. So you're going to see what I promised that we would have by the middle of the year will be the benchmark program for veterans in the state of Michigan. We will be the benchmark program in the United States. Now we might steal a little bit from that state and a couple ideas from that state, but we're going to put all the best ideas together. Uh, so that uh, kind of covers where we were at with, again, a lot of things with the veterans. And uh, it is quite a committee. We do meet every week, and you're welcome to come down to any of the committee meetings. You can also watch them online. Uh, or on TV, on MGTV. We don't get uh, televised too often, but we're going to try to re request, uh, we're going to request that we maybe get a little more airtime 
because of the things that we're doing as part of our veterans outreach people can watch it and they can sit in their home if they don't want to leave they can see what we're doing and see some faces and some names and, um, and we're going to start our welcome home program here in the next 60 days and it will be big and uh, I'm very excited about it. Uh, any questions on veterans and then we'll go to something else. So you can see the veterans program is not too stagnant. With all the veterans that are homeless, why couldn't the barracks from these two huge Air Force bases that are closed be used? We have, <clears throat> there's, there's two homes right now for veterans in the state of Michigan. Now, why we have them in the location, one's pretty easy to, see, easy to find out. Up in the UP is the Jacob Eddy. 700,000 veterans, you know about 90% of them are here in the thumb. From the tip of the thumb to Detroit. That's where most of our veterans live in the state of Michigan. And maybe 20% or so are scattered up through here. Grand Rapids is one home. And that's what, five or 600 beds, and that's going to get cut back a little bit. We have 20 or so beds available right now for homeless veterans. One of the problems that we have is identifying them and trying to get them to hop in the car and drive with somebody. And three, actually, is getting someone to drive them from, if we had a homeless veteran here, right now we could put them into Grand Rapids. Everything would be taken care of. And we changed that. As a matter of fact, uh, th that's going to go hand in hand with the bill that <clears throat> I just talked on today. We will be introducing, um, and I think two weeks, it should be ready to go as the Cold War Veterans Bill. Michigan only recognizes veterans who have served in certain wars. We don't recognize 200,000 veterans across the state of Michigan. That's wrong. Anybody who served their country, no matter where you served, should be recognized by the state of Michigan as a veteran. Now, it's been changed in the VA homes now for over a year, two years, three years. Is that, and even the state of Michigan didn't know, this was kind of an, an unannounced policy, is that the veterans' homes will take any veteran wherever you serve, as long as you have an honorable discharge, serve, I believe, 120 days and have something um, you know, honorable or in that area. But we have a number of vets right now for homeless veterans that we can't get them to come into. And again, here's our homes. We've got Jacob Eddy up in the UP, and then we've got over across the state in Grand Rapids. So a lot of them don't want to leave the side of the state. I've talked to families now who say they can't afford hospice programs for their veteran. They said, don't worry about it. We have it. Well, but we don't want to put dad or grandpa or my husband in Grand Rapids. Well, I can't really help you a whole lot there, but guess what? We do have another program where I can get you about $1,500 a month that a lot of our veterans don't know is available. You know, we work it through an attorney. We put your, uh, your assets into a trust, and we can get you. It's not a lot of money, but if you're going to be taken care of at home, it'll help a little bit. And very few veterans know of that. And the same thing goes for the spouse. If that person passes away, we can help get the spouse get 1035 a month to help them out. There are so many programs out there that we just don't have that one-stop shopping location. And that's what we're looking to do with the new Department of Veterans Affairs in the state of Michigan, is have a, that will kind of be the hub of this new project that we're working on. So we do have a problem with homeless veterans. And homeless female veterans, we have a problem with that. And with children. So we're working on that, and we just try to get the word out there. Call, call your representative if you hear something like that. We'll get the word out to law enforcement. Uh, we're working with the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, Office and the Disabled Veterans of America, the VANS, to make sure we have permission to have them tr have their volunteer drivers transport, just like they would do a VA home, transport a homeless veteran or a veteran in need to Grand Rapids or to the Jacob Eddy home. So we have been addressing that. <clears throat> what I really would like to see, and I know it's not always a popular thing, but the fact that the federal government will fund about 70% of this and the state would have to take care of 30. As we save the money off of this, like the prison system, we really need a veteran's home on this side of the state. We have nothing over here. We've got a couple small homes that are self-funded, but nothing by the state or the Fed. And when the Fed will pay uh, 65, I think it's 65% right now, um, I said, you know, I'm, I'm offering a really nice location. And that's uh, the Wachamaca facility area over by Carroll. I would love to see about 500 beds over there. That would be funded. We have lots of room. It's a beautiful location. You know, it's an area where guys from Detroit would be willing to come up. They could take a break. And the families, what do they have? An hour drive if you're in the Detroit area. A lot of the veterans, they want to get out. And I just can't picture this. I drive through there. Every time I drive, drive through the Carroll area, I always have to take that drive through. 
and try to picture what it would look like. And then I take a look at some of the old buildings. I say, wouldn't that make a great Legion Hall? Or a great VFW Hall? And you have a captive audience of 500 veterans? You know, that's the one I want to be the recruiter for that Legion post or VFW post or whatever, AMBES post, because uh, you've got a captive audience there. We have that opportunity, and we have a lot of support for it. And so we do have some very early discussions going on, um, whether or not it goes to that location or not. Also looking at the facilities, one of the things I have with my committee, uh, it's got one of the biggest budgets, about $2 billion, which is pretty remarkable to walk into this 30 days later, and congratulations, Mr. Chair. Um, you've got 1,400 buildings, a number of troops, including the Michigan State Police, 700,000 veterans, and the National Guard, and, uh, and a huge budget. But most of our budget is federally funded, so the more things that we bring in, and I know it's taxpayer dollars, but at least it brings it back to the state. So we're doing outreach also on the GI Bill, trying to get more veterans signed up. That's revenue to the state of Michigan. That brings people, that gets our, our veterans educated, it gets them in school, we've got new training programs. Um, I could spend the next hour and a half, but I'm gonna cut it short right now on the veteran stuff, unless there's any other questions. I, uh, yeah? I just ran a house for 50 young veterans this week. But my point is, is like, how about a lot of these kids, the first money they have ever made, and they've never had a job in all, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they're getting good money. So we, they, they don't teach them to get high pants too hard. You get money, why do they lie there in that? So that when they get out, they right. learn something. And you know what, and if that veteran comes home disabled, Oh, I know, but here, on top of that, if the veteran comes home disabled, they run him before a medical board, and they say, you know, instead of giving you a 50% or 60 or 80% disability rating, which will take care of you because of your injuries, which may be severe, but where, which are going to get worse year after year, you know what they offer them? They'll offer you $25,000 to take the check and go home. Now, you know what happens to that kid when he gets to $25,000? Or the same thing with the guy that returns from, he hasn't had a chance to spend any money in a year and a half, and now he goes to the bank. You know, I've got 50000 you go buy a truck, or you go buy something really fast, and you go buy a case of beer. And where's the next thing you're at? You usually stand up in front of the district court or circuit court judge. You're right, these young guys are in there, and they, they've got money. Yes, sir. Right on the bottom. There we go. There we go. Here's a, here's a question for you. <laughs> Retired uh, veteran, and uh, I've got a personal question and a kind of you know, comment. I just kind of push why are we trying to give felons, veterans, rights? They forfeit all other rights when they become a felon. There's the breakdown in, in where we look at not every veteran is going to go to a veteran's court, and some of them shouldn't have been there in the first place. Again, they came back, they had emotional issues or mental issues because of uh, several uh, IED explosions. Maybe they've got a traumatic brain injury they should have been addressed before they even got into prison. But, uh, you know, it's... We're not looking for benefits for the murderers, for the rapists, for the child molesters. You know, we're looking mostly at the guys that are getting their third drunk driving or they got busted doing something that, you know, who knows? We've got guys that you know, went in and wrote checks because they couldn't add and they end up in court. Uh, you know, maybe a small amount of drugs or something like that. Sure, it doesn't seem like a, uh, anything that we couldn't handle, many of us couldn't handle, but just like you mentioned, there's some young guys coming back and young women that they're putting themselves in rough positions that they wouldn't have done that before they went overseas. Yeah, and, a, and a personal question, I've been trying to get uh, Agent Orange veterans uh, benefit for five years. Got the uh, Vietnam service campaign the other stuff, combat veteran over there. I can't personally come up with the paperwork that proves I was in Vietnam. The government just keeps me and deny. I know. And I would, the fellows could tell you, I'm not interested in dealing with any of those organizations in the VA. I fully understand that. I won't even encourage a young man to join the service because of the way I've been treated. You know, right now, just Lou Gehrig's disease alone, they won't tell us why. But any veteran, not just combat veteran, right now, any veteran that comes and gets Lou Gehrig's disease qualifies for 100% disability without question. You show your DD-214, you get it, you qualify for benefits. My question on that was, what do they immunize us with sometimes? You know, we went through a lot of immunization lines where I got three shots, I got five shots, but, you know, I only show three right here. 
Oh, don't worry about that. Number two was part of the number one. Okay, that's why I was so sick that night. But on that, anyways, here's what I did with a friend of mine that came over. He's been trying to get benefits from Vietnam, and I may have mentioned this before. <clears throat> he couldn't find any of his records. Everything burned up in St. Louis. He had nothing left at home but a little black book with some of the guys that he served with. Now, Willie was now, whatever age he would be, 60-ish, 60, and we're talking about 1969. He came and sat in my house, and he went through VA, VSOs, and everybody else, and I said, you come over and spend an hour with me. So we went on the computer, he gave me this little black book of all these guys when they were 17, 18, and 19. We Google searched them. We pulled the names up, and I called that person up. And I've probably told this story before. But I called that person up in Iowa. And that guy might have lived in another county, but we found him. And, of course, when I picked up the phone, they said, you know, this is Kurt Dammer. I'm calling from the Thumb area. I'm representing a friend of mine here, Willie, and, and his last name. Did you happen to serve with him in Vietnam? Of course, there was usually a, usually a few seconds of silence by a lot of uh, uh, happy curse words. <laughs> and he says, he's still alive? You know, yeah, he's right here on the phone. We called, I think, five people within about two hours and asked them to send pictures of him with them, send us their documents, and most of those guys were getting their disability because they had their records, whatever was needed. They sent that. So the VA, if you have three documents from three veterans you serve with and can show a couple of pictures, that's just as good as having those documents yourself. And he uh, has been trying for years and has a number of problems. He had been trying for years. Within just a few months, he had 100% disability for he and his wife. And that's what we did. But you don't hear anybody promoting that, that if you have documents from three other veterans with your pictures, and they give you a statement with their name on it, especially if they have, you want to have it certified, you get that, that goes into a packed package, and that, you know where it goes, unfortunately? That pile of 20,000, yeah. That's why you give it to a representative from the Marine Corps League or American Legion. You have them hand carry that for you down there. I'll be glad to help you do that. I'll give you a little outline, but uh, yeah, you can. We can do that. Uh, anything else on the veterans? Let's go to a real fun. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I came in kind of late, mm -hmm. but I just found out this week that a good friend of mine, her grandson, had two tours in Iraq, and he got fired this week because he can't sleep at night and he can't sleep. So therefore, he fought, when he finally falls asleep in the morning. Doesn't wake up and he doesn't get to work on time. And right. Yeah. And his mother said, "What am I going to do with him?" We need he to get we need to get him with his documents DD two fourteen. We need to get him to a VA. Okay. We need to get him to a VA hospital. And we need to get him evaluated. They have to be scheduled to get an evaluation. We schedule them to get an evaluation. We schedule them with the VSO. I highly re recommend the Order of the Purple Heart. They were did a remarkable job. Uh, you know, I thought I was an expert. I really was an expert in doing a lot of the documents. Until you get a hold of somebody like Order of Purple Heart or American Legion or VFW, their VSOs. And they take that hand carry. If you do it through your county veteran service officer, and I'm not slamming the county veteran service officers, but they don't leave the county. This group, with the, the Legions and VFW and Purple Heart, Marine Corps League, they'll sit down with the veteran, fill everything out, and if they know that guy needs help or that woman needs help right now, they take that package and they will hand carry it down to the VA in Detroit. And they will set an appointment to talk directly to a VA counselor face to face that most of them know. And they say, I need this. I know you got 22,000 backed up, but here's what we need right now or we're going to lose this guy. So we can do that. We can do that. Yeah. And uh, especially if they're, are they in our district? They're our district. Yeah, there are, well, there are districts, you know what, it doesn't make any difference. Let me know because I'll tag a letter on it if they need some help. It's kind of nice to have a little bit of clout. Not much, but at least a little in Lansing. Don't get it at home all the time. Tim. I don't really need I'm with the uh, American Legion Post in Richville. The, the one you see up on the screen that we're having a chicken barbecue. That's not the advertisement I wanted to do right now. I work for Judge Glaspie in the district court in Carroll. I had a Marine come in. This is talking about what Kurt said. He brought in young man. I mean, you could tell he's a Marine, and I was in the Navy. So I said, I'll overlook the fact you were a Marine. 
And he kind of smiled, but he showed me his NCO, his corporal, it comes right from the commandant, and he showed me his sergeant stripe. He went home, he went home, he's, he's still with us, thank God, but he went home, he got into a fight with his dad, like Kurt was talking about. He was missed, and he was diagnosed with, here Kurt saying the initial post-traumatic stress disorder. He was in heavy combat. He saw his friends get blown apart in front of him. He comes in with a domestic violence, and they, I watched him. Now, it's kind of hard for what, this Marine had tears run down the side of his face in front of my judge. And I thought, it just, it was ripping, it was ripping me up. And he says, I've got to go back. I've got to go back. They've got to let me go back. This young man, he's getting treatment, but there are many more like him. I see it, I'm sorry to say, on a regular basis. So what Kurt's doing, now I didn't have this. I told him where he should, you know, where he could go to the Saginaw VA clinic, you know, to try to get help. And I recommended some of our service officers at the American Legion. But this young man, this is what's coming back from our conflicts. Any of you guys that were in Korea or World War II, you know too. My dad told me. They go to bed. He he was in Normandy. He was everywhere. And he started watching Saving Private Ryan and he said, Turn it off. Turn it off. And that's what these kids are coming back just like we went. The guys in this room that went know what I'm talking about. And some of the ladies that might have been there. But support Kurt on these veterans things. I applaud him. It was everything I could could do not to start applauding and standing up. But that's what we've needed for years. They ignore the veterans. The federal government, when it comes to budget cuts, they look at the veterans. They look at these young men, and if you see the Wounded Warrior Project, and another thing, the adopt a platoon which Judy, my wife, is involved heavily with those, if you see the letters from these kids over there, and the chaplains that have written us letters saying thank you, Thank you so much. A hospital in uh, Afghanistan, they wanted just different colored pillowcases because these guys can't get out of bed. They're paraplegic because of the wounds they've suffered. And that's the kind of support I like to see Kurt working on. And thank you very much. Thank you. same thing with my cousin, even he came home from Vietnam, and I've talked about that. One of the reasons I put together the Michigan-Vietnam Traveling Wall in 2005, that's, it's been in the area. And uh, he came home from one tour as a riverboat gunner, well, it was a uh, twin 50 caliber gunner on the front of a riverboat, came back to Kindy, and lasted about three weeks, and I, and I was just a little kid, and I still remember him coming back, because it was so remarkable as a kid to have a soldier in the family. But three weeks later, I remember, I, I still remember my dad saying, you know, uh, something as we stood back by a chicken coop about Oliver leaving to go back to service. <clears throat> and we talked about this as time went on. Um, he went back for his second tour. His first day back on the river, he was shot by a sniper. But he, he wouldn't have survived back here. It's just the way it was. And every day when we would go walking, I remember this as a kid for those couple of weeks, he would pick me up, <clears throat> come to the house, and we would go walk down on the river bank through the weeds, in the reeds, in the cattails, back into the woods. We didn't walk uptown. And uh, I never really put a lot of that together until many years later. And that's what happens. It still happens today. Sir? You mentioned a GI Bill for Michigan. Yes, yes sir. Attempting to put together a really <clears throat> Well, the new GI Bill is pretty remarkable because a lot of people don't know. They haven't heard about it. The new GI Bill has had some changes. And the new GI Bill will also allow for your spouse to, to take your place and, and get education. There's a, I'm not an expert by far on the new GI Bill, but it is starting to get some use. One of the new organizations we have is Student Veterans of America, and uh, they are part of our, our military summits. As a matter of fact, our next one will be either the 22nd or the 25th of this month when we put all this stuff uh, finally together. Yeah. Well, I was in charge of the base hospital in Fort Bragg, uh, North Carolina. We had no psychologists, we had uh, uh, no one to speak to us. We just got discharged, traveled home on my own box. And, and shortly after that, I heard about the G. 
FBI bill. It was one of the best investments this country ever made in the World War II country. And it gave us an opportunity to see our own psychologists. We met others that had served in combat, and we had an opportunity to share and lie and uh, <laughs> about our combat experiences. But nevertheless, we had an opportunity to work that off, and along with the education we received at uh, the colleges, that uh, uh, we uh, became a credit for society instead of uh, what some of us would have turned out to be. Right. Yeah, it is a great program. So pursue that if it's, yeah. uh, and, and we need to get that out there. I haven't touched my GI Bill, and I should be slapped alongside the head, even though I get that every day anyways. But uh, really, the GI Bill is pretty remarkable.